are here for our, this is our fourth q and A, I I think. Um, and we're, Michael is here to answer lots of your questions that you've sent in. Michael Cotts, you probably already know, but is principal flute with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, um, Academy of St. Martin's, London Mozart Players and London Symphonietta, as well as a busy professor at Royal Academy of Music and freelance um, soloist and I mean, Michael does everything. <laughs> and um, today is going to be a little bit different. We're going to try and get through as many questions as possible today. So they might be slightly briefer answers, but we have had so many and Michael's keen to make sure that everybody gets a response. Um, so I think, are we ready to start, Michael? We are. Although one thing I wanted to mention is we're hatching a new plan. <laughs> um, so we're we're thinking that this will be the last of the Q&A ones uh, for a bit. Um, but we're going to start with a new venture, um, I think with a sort of orchestral excerpts masterclass sort of situation. And we're gonna ask people to um, send in some excerpts recorded um, and then we can chat around those. Um, and maybe we're, we're, we're yet to work out exactly the fine tuning of it, but it was just a recent idea we've had um, just for something a bit different. Um, to be going on with um so anyway we'll but just keep an eye on the facebook page or whatever and yeah uh, yeah and also um we michael's keen said he's keen to answer more questions about orchestral excerpts so if anyone has questions specifically about orchestral excerpts please comment them on the um on the street on the stream below the video and we'll be able to see them and then we can try and answer as many as possible yeah cool great <laughs> So it, wanna, should we get going with these questions? Because there's a... Uh, yeah, there's a lot to do, yeah. There's okay. a lot to get through. So the first one is from Cobus, and it is, what are your strategies for producing a reliable fourth octave? Do you have any thoughts on alternative fingerings? Reliable and fourth octave don't always go together in my experience. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, you know, go on, talk about extreme sport. Um, I'm, I was quite intrigued by your question as to kind of what the situation that you're in, that you're, you know, looking at this, whether you play a lot of contemporary or whether you play jazz, because um, it's usually one or a t'other of those that um, get you going with that. Um, and um, my, my big thing about it generally is obviously the level of sport is going to be humongous. Um, and the thing, the feeling I have is that most people have the impulse to shoot out a huge amount of air. Um, and it's kind of harnessing. You need a feeling of a jet stream of air because obviously it's a bit like a whistle tone. Or, no, sorry, not whistle, a jet whistle. Um, something where you need so much pressure in the body to deliver a very, very highly energized um, air stream. Um, but I think often what tends to happen is people just push out huge quantities of air at the same time. Um, and can't quite deal with that internally or with the embouchure and the delivery of the flute can be a bit, um, you know, over the top really. So if I'm going something like <laughs> that kind of effect, of <laughs> you feel you're gonna blow your music as way well as you're gonna do it. Um, and so for my idea is, is very much to try and gel it down into a sort of iron rod of air. Um, it sounds like a contradiction in terms for starters. Um, <laughs> And what I feel I'm doing is trying to find a huge level of resistance in the body. Obviously, you want a tiny embouchure um, to try and zone it down. Um, and what I have a, a sort of a thing I think of, um, which is not actually the case, of course, but I have in my head, I have the feeling of wanting to glue the air to the top edge of the um, lip plate as I'm playing. Um, so narrowing it down. Then the other thing I think is just not healthy, is it really, basically? <laughs> it's not healthy for the ears. It's not healthy for your sanity. And then, I mean, I think for all of us, you do it for like such a short period of time and you're beginning to get dizzy, you know, and you, you don't feel so great. Um, so of course it comes with a health risk. Please put those plugs in um, if you're gonna experience this. And like a lot of things, it's just dip in there on a regular basis if you want to establish it. Um, but I think all of our impulses, do we want to play a long fourth register note? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but like any other sounds in any other part of the register you, uh, of the instrument, you need to really spend a bit of time 
obviously they're not going to be super long um but the longer you can sustain them but really take the rests between the attempts um and i think you build up more and more control by the sustain involved um in terms you asked question about fingerings and so um from you know e flat e um f and f sharp um i just have my fingerings that seem to work for my flute um and you know on the online of course there's rafts of fingerings and i've tried them i've i've been through all those lists and you go um that doesn't remotely work on my flute um and so you know i think I think it's a bit weird that, of course, the fingerings don't anywhere else in the flute work on everybody's flute. You know, they seem to work. Um, but when it comes to multiphonic fingerings and to these extreme top, I find that you've just got to find the ones that work for your instrument. And at that stage, I'm just sticking with the ones I knew because, uh, you know, and if they're a bit internationally wayward, um, I think, well, you know, that's kind of what you're asking for if you're right up there. I remember having a piece called um, The Seven Days. It was by an um, amazing composer called Thomas Adish. Um, and that, I actually counted all the top notes because I was just so, so shocked there were so many of them so for so much of the time, including, mm -hmm. like, really rapid passage work. It was ins It is an insane piece. It's wonderful being music, actually. Um, but, you know, the demands, I, I remember just counting every single one and going like, I can't believe it. I've got something like, you know, 37 top E's. Um, another extraordinary repertoire piece in the classical um, genre is the um, Schoenberg wrote um, a, he orchestrated Brahms's uh, piano, one of his piano quartets. Um, and that is absolutely insane as well. Uh, that's got notated top G's, super, super top G's. Um, which, uh, I mean, I had a flute that would play a top G some time ago, <laughs> but I can't, I can't get that squeak out of my current flute. Um, so F sharp's where I finish. Um, and, um, but in terms of C, C sharps and Ds, there are alternative fingerings that are really useful. Um, and of course we're going to see those notes far, far more. Um, and in terms of a top C fingering, um, I, I virtually never use what is perceived to be the standard fingering, which sounds great. You know, it sounds, it's a good sound, um, but it's just so horrendously sharp and orchestra, you just can't use it. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, you can add, you know, extra key. So if I'm on a top C standard fingering, then you can half hold, you can do that. You can add true keys and foot joints. Um, but the one I use a lot, which I know, um, from conversation with other principal flutes, they also use this B without the thumb, which is like the trill fingering from B to C trill. Um, it's quite, it's actually flat. Um, so it's, it's quite a novel experience to actually be like pushing up the pitch. <laughs> um, and what means is that because the B is also sharp that you have to therefore use a flat of fingering, which I, I use for the B. Um, and similarly with the C sharp, there's all sorts of combinations, like whether you have a little thing, the G sharp key on or not, whether you half hole around it, have it on, but you know, and you can experiment with those um, and uh, discover what you like. Top D was quite a funny one actually, because I was brought up in Zimbabwe in Africa. And I was, somebody said, you you should play the Prokofios now. So I thought, well, oh yeah. And simply no one in that country at that time knew the fingering for a top D and there was no internet. <laughs> and there was no book either, which had a top D fingering in it um, that anyone had in that country. So um, I, I remember just experimenting and coming out with quite a random one that not many people use, which is just B flat thumb, um, D key, the D sharp key and, and the C sharp key at the bottom there at the same time. So very few fingers on. And it's it's actually quite useful in some passage work, it works better. Um, there's good sound. Um, and so I sometimes use that as an alternative top D. And then you've got to decide whether you want the gizmo on, whether you want the, uh, if you've got B foot or the, the C foot, you know, you've got some alternatives. So up to that point, yeah, alternative fingering beyond, forget it. I just <laughs> like, you know, I just have my fingerings on, I just go with them. Thanks. Yeah. Just find a fingering that works, basically. <laughs> um, so we have some live questions, if you'd like to look at one of those, Michael. Oh, yeah. There's, there's one from Mina Middleton. Uh-huh. She says, hello, I have a question about Prokofiev, Peter and the Wolf. 
Um, how do you play it as fast as it as, as it's meant to be? I practice it as fast as I can, but it feels so much faster in context with the rest of the ensemble and feels impossible to make every note to be heard. Or do we just pray for a kind conductor? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think kind of all of the above. Um, <laughs> yes, we do pray. Um, the problem is there's something about Peter's tune that is just like it's in everybody's brain how fast that should go um and of course i think mostly mean is probably referring to the horrendous stuff in a flat major um um i think a lot of it comes down to excellence at moving register um so i think a lot of people see because it's over three octaves that that particular phrase at such speed but also you've got obviously lots of g sharp kind of fingerings for using the pinky a lot on that hand um and it, it is plain awkward um but i think if one can find a median point where one can sign sound low and high from and then also that the low is not a, you don't actually go down for the low you don't go to, down to the bottom and then have to climb back up again um but that is, if you're voicing it, it's something I got a lot from um, having singing lessons, is placing the voice in a place where the whole phrase will work. And, the, and it's not just about voice placement, but it's also energy placement, that you're choosing an energy that will help you dispatch. So basically, you don't have to move a twitch, uh, in theory. <laughs> um, and, um, but that's kind of how it feels. It's just like, I'm set, I'm going, and then everything will sound from that one production point um, and that really is a huge aid to um, to speed and uh, velocity through those kind of passages um, and then I, I mean I ju just as words encouragement you know I can remember you know when I was younger it, it just didn't want to happen particularly and mm -hmm. then just all of a sudden it did a bit like the classical symphony mm -hmm. um, and now I, I'm such I've feel a bit weird like a bit perverse in a way because now I actually really look forward to Peace and the Wolf and classical symphony whereas when i was younger I thought, Ooh. <laughs> um and i'll go oh yippee <laughs> um so i don't mean, know but that's a bit weird um <laughs> to some extent but but um i do think the opening should go that fast as well it's amazing that fast i mean by the opening i mean the bird tune 176 is incredibly fast um as is the other thing i mean most of it is to be honest um but it's so brilliantly written and it's so good. Um, and so I think it's just rigorously carrying on. But the, because of velocity, it's mainly that thing of just trying to find one production that will dispatch everything. Um, and a lot of support through, pushing, 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 pushing through. Um, pushing maybe is the wrong word, but just that mm, kind of drive through it. Um, because you don't actually want that kind of feeling going like, ah, <laughs> um, because that will only add to tension because you need to sound very, very cool. Um, and just like, so that it's just like birdsong, you know, they go, blah, 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 tweet, 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 tweet. Um, and they just sound very cool doing it, you know, second nature. And it's got to sound like second nature, but um, yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually um, one of the things I watched recently uh, as part of this sort of, um, online arts that are being released um, what now we're all in lockdown was the Royal Opera House released a recording on their YouTube of um, their ballet of Peter and the Wolf which is definitely worth a watch if anyone wants some inspiration for sort of wow. visualisation of the, the characters. Yeah. And that's really good. Uh, and I should say about that sort of thing that the, you know, the autopilot thing is huge yeah. um, just generally because, you know, sometimes we look at these speeds and just think it's not possible. I remember I got I got a, a piccolo concerto written to me for me by a guy called Simon Holt, um, fantastic composer, um, and I got the part and it said the main tempo was uh, crotchet equals two hundred and nineteen, <laughs> um, and and it was just insanely fast and I just thought I just don't think and because also if you try and tap your foot at two hundred and nineteen it just doesn't want to happen but also incredibly complex rhythms and changes of time signature you know all the time additive um, time signatures um and i just thought i don't know and i thought I, I thought i'm gonna have to be pragmatic and probably take a slower tempo but actually you know just by if you just keep going the body goes like yeah i know that stuff but of course you have to build it up speed wise um and just keep pressing keep pressing keep pressing go back a stage 
two notches further stairs and it's just if your your body kind of gives up in the end it goes like oh if you really want me to do that thing i suppose i will <laughs> eventually eventually <laughs> thank you thank you mina for sending yeah me. thanks mina um we also have another live question or would you like to go back to oh why not let's knock on the head while we got it another another live question is from pasha who for those of you who don't know he set up the website principal chairs so he is, he's the boss. Yes, he's the he boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he asks, uh, how long on average would you say it takes to prepare well for an orchestral audition? Well, I mean, this is a huge frustration, I think, for a lot of us. Um, I mean, not me anymore, I'm glad to say. But because uh, I, find, I find it so naughty that so many of the orchestras tell people what they are playing so late. Um, and I just don't think it's fair on people because sometimes they set, you know, 30 excerpts or something, some, sometimes ridiculously long lists, and then say, you know, play this piece, that other piece. And then you know they're going to hear such a small percentage of it. Um, and then they give people two weeks notice, and I just think it's just not fair. Mm. Um, so, uh, so I think the average bit is somewhat colored by how much notice the orchestra is giving people. Um, and I, I just think it's really bad form because they know that they've got auditions coming up. So whether it gets stuck in the, with the librarian or the person who's putting out the advertisements or somebody, you know, the flute players or the panelists can't quite make up their mind what the excerpt should be, I don't know. Um, but basically all I would say as an overview of it is like as long as possible. <laughs> I mean, because they're such important moments um, not only in terms of you know career but also in terms of development i think they're real markers of where you've got to at any given point um and we always invest a huge amount of effort and energy in them um so i think it's it's you know it's just one of those moments you should throw everything at. i always think of auditions and making recordings as the quite similar in a way because they're, they're kind of benchmark placements of where where you've got to and so, you know, I think it's you should really do your utmost. Um, so, yeah, just as just as long as you've got Rennie. And I suppose the difficulty is the feeling of staleness. If, if someone's really going, you know, months, months of preparation. Um, but then I would just say mix it up, you know, one day do this, make a chart of what you're going to visit when. And then also if you're getting bored or something and you feel you can't be fresh about it, then start listening around it. Yeah. Yeah. In your orchestras, um, how long do you know how long your standard time is to give out? How long in advance you give out excerpts? I, I would say about a month, three weeks a month. But that's you know, that's my experience because if I'm involved on a panel, oh. I'm really quite intent on trying yeah. to get them to <laughs> get yeah. the stuff out there because I just don't think it's fair. And often I'm going to to colleagues. I know it's nice to, you can think that piece shows this, this one, so, but we have to be realistic about how much you're going to hear in an audition. And mm -hmm. is it fair to give them 22, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because sometimes people see it as like, oh, I could ask this one, I could ask that one because it does this and that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going like, it's not fair that these people have got lives to live as well as auditions to do. <laughs> and they get to do a better audition and show more about what they're up to mm -hmm. um, if it's not just overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the shortest time I've ever been given with an excerpt pack before an audition was for an orchestral scheme. It was for the final round, and I got the, sent the excerpts. I think two days before. Yeah, yeah. which wasn't particularly fun. <laughs> um, no. Pasha, great question. Um, should we move back to the list? So we have Laura Simmons. Um, how do you think the music industry will respond in the wake of COVID nineteen? What will the long term impacts be on classical musicians, especially? Um, and I was hoping to apply for music colleges this autumn. Do you think they will run auditions? Okay, I mean, to be honest, I can't answer this one um, in a way because we we simply don't know. We don't know how long it's going on for. We don't know, um, uh, you know, what it means for, I'm not inside the financial workings of in organizations. Um, it's got to have ramifications. It's just got to have, unfortunately for all of us. Um, and, um, yeah, so my viewpoint really is that 
the music industry, I mean, you know, everyone's always on about how grim it is and how difficult it is. And, um, and it is in many respects, but my goodness, it's good at surviving. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so in London here, we have six symphony orchestras, two opera orchestras. And I think I could think of like eight main chamber orchestras. Um, uh, there are mm, other ones as well. Um, and various organizations have been trying to kill off some of those for a long time um, because they're going, there's too much and we can't fund all these or we can't support these. And, and you know, and, um, and many of them aren't funded at all anyway, but they still survive. So there was a big review uh, some years back now um, where they reduced vast amounts of fundings and gave more to some and reduced and took away from the others, thinking it would kill them off. Um, and it hasn't. <laughs> um, and um, and that's why I just think it's amazing. And I think if anything dips, it's you know it's a bit like a weed or something. <laughs> you you pull out one weed and another one pops up in another place. Um, and you know and I think there's always young people coming through who want to do their own thing, um, and they will always set up things. And some of it is because also their young colleagues will be prepared to do things for less money probably than they should um, to get things going. You know, it's exciting and it's vibrant and it's cool. And then some of those will take seed, take root, and will establish themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think you know I think it will have distinct ramifications. But I'm I'm also gently optimistic about you know somehow it all happens, it all still keeps going. Um, I think that people are going to you know like everyone's saying from all sort all manner of work is that people are going to be changed by this experience and i do see a lot more happening online um there's nothing like live music so i think you know of course that's not going to go away um you know that's not going to be impinged but i think you know like old codgers like me <laughs> i've learned quite a lot about tech and uh you know and this you know you suddenly think oh yeah this is really cool because you can get to you know more people you can be a helpful person um and um you know, and I think it's just going to grow. And actually, one of the organizations I'm with has got a fascinating and huge idea. I mean, really novel and big. Um, and I'm not at liberty to say what it is, but I've just been like, <laughs> I, I've been like, wow, that is like, why hasn't anyone thought of this before? And the simple reason is because we were all a bit stuck in our rut and, you know, you, it's hard to take that step. But this has sort of you know broken down a lot of barriers and so i think it would be really interesting and i can see some really interesting things and you know i think all of us should you know it was going that way anyway but you know the online world is going to be just big yeah so yeah good kind of good news and bad news mm -hmm. yeah. and music college auditions oh yeah I forgot about that bit um yeah it's going to happen i reckon you know yeah yeah Great. Send, send me a rude letter if i'm wrong but <laughs> <laughs> they'll find they, they'll find a way yeah. Um, it might be distance, it might be on, you know, streamed, it might be whatever. Um, but we, most of them already do video applications from various parts of the world anyway. So it's, yeah, it'll happen. Yeah. Great. We have another live question from Sally Minter. Oh. Um, I right. think actually this question might have been asked in a previous interview, but I just wanted to, it wanted if you wanted to give a brief answer as hopefully Sally's still watching. She asked, if we can still ask questions, what would you expect to hear differently <laughs> in an orchestral audition for a second flute position rather than a first flute position? Yeah, um, we did actually the last session, didn't we? I, I think uh, it was. Yeah, it was. Um, we did answer that. And I think I said it was the same but different. So it, <laughs> you're, you're looking for the same excellence in all respects. And I was saying in a nutshell that it's a mistake to think of downsizing yourself. You still want, you're still looking for that, that vibrant musician um, and fantastic musician um, and that personality and that ring. But the only thing I would say about it was I felt about it as being a sense of being that one would slightly have more focus on being well groomed. Um, mm -hmm. So, that, you know, you could be a, probably a little bit more mad as if it was a principal, <laughs> <laughs> but you might want to be a little bit more on the, on the groomed side for the second flute. Um, mm -hmm. But I just also highlighted the, the danger of actually playing everything because you think this that person will like it or won't and all that kind of nonsense. You need to be true to yourself, um, but just play brilliantly and be tidy. Mm -hmm. A bit like Sally, really. 
<laughs> Great. Um, so back to our questions that have been sent in advance. We have one from Maeve and she asks, how does Michael feel about self-promotion on the various different social media platforms? Is it necessary or possibly vital to have an online, pre online presence in this day and age? So I don't think it's either necessary or vital, um, but I think it's advisable to some extent. Um, and what I feel is, is do it well. Um, because you don't want to annoy your peer group. <laughs> you don't want to be braggy. Mm -hmm. So I think often it's good if your viewpoint or your, your, what you highlight is something that incorporates other people um, and a, there's some aspect of what you're doing that is cool that you can highlight. Um, like, isn't this amazing piece or isn't this an amazing, you know, I just, I heard this pianist, it was amazing or whatever, but um, you know what I mean? So that you, you keep awareness of you being there and out there. Um, and then if it's got a context, like I saw this person, <laughs> you know, I think that's fine, but it, it's just, there's, there's one instrumentalist I know that of his own instrument, He's annoyed a lot of people, huge amount. Um, and he gets a lot of mention. And personally, I feel sorry for this guy. <laughs> I know people who know him, I don't personally know him. Um, and um, and I think it's a bit like bullying in a way because you know he's only trying to do, he's not doing anything bad, right? Um, but, and, and by all accounts, and people that do know him say he's actually a really nice guy. Um, but just from his online presence, he's managed to step on a lot of toes, but also it's just too much in your face, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't looked at his, what he's got online. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just do it well and be positive. Draw other people in to your experience. But, you know, obviously you don't want to go like, I'm having a fantastic life. I'm brilliant. <laughs> Sorry about you. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you wouldn't do that, Maeve. <laughs> yeah. But you, I don't have a lot of experience because I've got no online presence. That's what I was about to say. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't have um, social media or a website, am I right? No, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> I remember doing a recital in America in a university. Um, and the woman who introduced me before I went on was going like, what do you need to know about this guy? He doesn't even have a website. <laughs> uh, um and the thing is, I'm busy enough. And also, I've got a slightly, dare I say it, this is airing your stuff in public, but I've got a slightly obsessive nature. Um, <laughs> so I know I just waste so much time. And I feel I'd rather do other things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Maeve. The next question from James Wilson is, what advice would you give to achieve good, good intonation and low register when playing a true pianissimo or PPP? I think the answer is that. <laughs> Pray. Um, so there are things you can do. And one of the things I'm quite interested in about, I was just thinking about this earlier, um, and actually I'm going to make resource to it. I've got this fantastic new tuner on my, on my phone, which is called TE Tuner. I hope they give me some money for this. <laughs> but honestly, it's such a good tuner. And I did have to pay a small amount for it, but it is so better so much better than anything I've used. And it can also sound different sounds and sine waves and stuff. So you can actually build up chords and then play against them and stuff as well. It's really, really good tuner. Um, but for instance, um, if I play something like a low D and then play it um, different kind of coloring, and then another coloring, That all got the green light on the tuner. Um, and it's really, really interesting because they sound intonationally really different just because of the coloring of the sound. So I think there's more to it than just playing in tune. I, I think there's a real art of making it sound in tune. Um, and sometimes something that's in tune, but has got a flat edge, sounds worse, something that's a bit flat, <laughs> but actually sounds a bit, you know, Live, more alive and more air passing through it. So a kind of depressed sound of any sort. I mean, that is flat, but um, <laughs> you know, but any of that kind of presentation will make people feel it's flat. Um, I, I think, I mean, it's just the same deal, isn't it? That loud and high for us is a huge problem on the flute. 
and low and softness equal, you know, is the two main things, you know. Um, so a big defining thing about this was head joint position, obviously, as well. Um, so you're looking at the demands of what you got. So if you've got um, something which is you're playing some part, which is very delicate, soft music, and a lot of it is low, push in, you know. <laughs> um, similarly, as it was loud and high, I'd be pulling out. Um, and if you've got both in one piece, then you're in trouble. <laughs> um, but sometimes I even do a bit of that, you know, in the midst of pieces. Some people find that shocking, but I'm going like, I want an easy life um, and a short life because I feel like if I'm trying to hold the pitch up de desperately all the time, um, that my entree is going to give way at some point. Um, and... Um, one thing that I think is really interesting is that just in terms of human expression, um, so in anything that is downwards basically flattens. So if I go like, oh, that's obviously going to be a, a real downer, literally. Um, and that's physical as well. So if you if the, if the chin's going to go down, oh, where do I go? Ah, immediately, you know, it's a much more brighter presentation of pitching. Um, and communication. Um, but similarly, so when you're low well, and very soft, one of the things I think that's going to happen is that upper face becomes very important. So I'm sometimes known as Mr. Eyebrows by some <laughs> little kids. <but laughs> uh, because when I play, I, I've just done, because I've been doing lots of videos for online stuff and playing quite a bit, um, I've I just watched one of them just briefly, and I just went, oh, God, yeah, those eyebrows are ready to go. <laughs> but anyway, when you're low on the flute, um, and you that kind of upper face thing will pull muscles up in such a way that it really does aid more smiley pitching, literally, um, in terms of intonation as well. Um, there's a there's a payoff, really. Because for a lot of us, the best sounds that we want to make at the bottom will tend us towards flatness. So some of the times I'm not always making my favoritist low register noise um, if it's very, very soft. Um, and what I find another helpful thing, I think, is jaw position. Because mostly for bigger low sounds, we bring the lower jaw back a bit um, to get depth of sound. But in the very soft things, I think I would take a more forward jaw position, making everything should be held up, actually, the chin, the flute itself, um, and also a little bit more forward with the jaw, because if I've got a feeling of, that's me with the jaw fairly far back for a soft note. Um, and you get a few more whiffles and whistles. Um, but you get the intonation of your, you know, if you just really need that thing that the first requirement is going to be the intonation of it. Um, then I'd add, um, I would do the old, put a tuning machine on and then do the. And see how that goes. Did that all sound the same, Camilla? Because no, it didn't. <laughs> these, these things, you know, sometimes standardized dynamic. No, it didn't um, sound the same. Uh, that's a relief. Um, <laughs> yeah, and fortunately, my tuning machine was kind to me. I've got the, that's another nice thing about this tuning machine, if I can show you. Um, but in, um, in the middle of that is a lovely, lovely bit. And then the longer you play in tune, you get a bigger and bigger smiley face. It's a green smiley. It's very, very pretty, um, <laughs> but it's very encouraging, I have to say. Um, so, yeah, that's my, that's my, oh, another thing I thought of um, is that um, actually practice playing sharp because everyone goes like, oh, thank gosh, I've got it, I've got it up to pitch now. Yay. You know, and I managed it. But very few people push it further because if you learn the skills of actually playing sharp at the bottom, then you, you've got, you know, you're well on the way. You know what I mean? You need to almost overcook it and experience that. Even if the sound's a bit rubbish, um, then then you know those skills are much better. Um, then the other thing I thought was that for singers, so if we're going down, if you go with the music, so you go, ah, you get a sag. But if you at the same time, you like go up steps, I'm trying to see where my hand is in terms of the camera. Here we go. And so you go, ha, 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 ha. So you're rising up with all the steps. 
So you invert the interval structure. Um, and it really changes vocally what happens. Um, and it keeps the sound brighter and it keeps it um, more vibrancy. Mm. Hope that helps. Okay, brilliant. Um, our next question is from Laura Jellico. And she says, um, hi, Michael, sending you and the whole flute community lots of love. Great also to see Camilla again. So um, these sessions are wonderful. Keep them coming. Well, we've that had a was that a question? <laughs> that, that's the introduction. <laughs> and the question is, how's your online teaching going? And do you have any tips for us mortals? Oh, mortals, indeed. Um, <laughs> actually, she's the one to talk because she's an angel. I don't know anyone that knows Laura. Too. She's officially a walking angel. Um, <laughs> hasn't The wings are just hidden at the moment. Um, and and absolutely amazing flute teacher. Um, I strongly suspect she's got more ideas than I have on this. Um, and uh, so you've got the various platforms, you know, so it's a matter of for me. So I'm just going to talk about, about my personal experience of it. Uh, I haven't really got any major tips. Um, some students of mine have come up recently with something called Source Connect, uh, which is also under the umbrella of Source Elements. Um, and this is audio only, um, but you can run it concurrently with video. Some people say they've had great results. So far, I've had nil success whatsoever with it. <laughs> but some of my students say, no, no, when it works, it's amazing. So you, you can try that. Um, and of course, with Zoom, you know, it's that business turning off the the turning on to uh, original sound rather than so that it doesn't think your speech and do weird things to the flute sound. Um, so a lot of people also using the business about uh, getting people to email uh, or put on YouTube. And uh, so you've got links to performances that they've done already. And then you listen to it at the beginning of the lesson. Do you do that, Camilla? You, you teach online. Um, I haven't done that, but I've heard of colleagues doing that with advanced students. Yes, um, I can imagine that. Yeah. It's my students aren't that advanced, but because the sound quality is better if you record it in advance. Yes, exactly. Well. Yeah. 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 I I kind of um, there's an element to that. I mean, I like I, I like the idea, and the, the thing is, uh, so yeah, just to go on with it. Um, I've been really surprised that I find it actually really enjoyable and absolutely fine on the whole. Mm -hmm. Um. And I suppose you just kind of cut your cloth a bit because there are some aspects of it that I don't focus on. And there's other aspects that I focus on more. Um, and what I would say I find really interesting is the shift of responsibility in the lesson. So because I'm having to go to them a lot more like, how do you think that came across? Um, when you did that, well, how loud were you playing? <laughs> um, so I'm actually doing a lot more of that kind of self-evaluation or, you know, the, I just as post, part of the process of the lesson is like a bit like, and did you feel there was enough contrast there? Because it's hard to tell from Skype, you know. Um, and so I found, and I think they're quite, I get the feeling they're quite enjoying that, um, that kind of thing. And also definitely um, I find it's actually more, a bit more performance based, um, which is something about the pre-prepared ones that I sort of wonder about. Actually, I'm funny enough, I'm teaching for the, Australian National Academy of Music tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, they've done that. And so that would be my first experience of, of hearing that. Um, but I really feel that online is great for actually more performance flow than you normally get on one-to-one -one lessons in a room. Um, so I think I've learned as a teacher from that, um, that there's something very good about the fluency of just more performance. Um, and as a teacher, I'm sometimes a bit frustrated that I, because I, I love talking about the music, and I sometimes teaching you think, oh, you know, these wretched brass tacks that you have to grapple with all the time, um, and get get stuff sorted. You know, of course you have to. Um, but it's been nice to have this little oasis where you can primarily just talk about music and, um, you know, the lovely phrasing and <laughs> how it structures and what you might do about that. And so I've we I think we've kind of a bit suspended the technical. Stuff so the technical side of thing is is harder, but I've still we've still done some technical stuff with people and it still works and we've talked a lot about articulation and it seems to, you know, it's it's just seems to be fine actually, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, the main thing I would say also uh, of interest to me is that I've also been the other side of the process because I've been having Skype viola lessons, <laughs> and um, and. It's it's 
for me as a you know having had the experience of just a few lessons because i'm a complete beginner um before lockdown and now having the skype lessons it doesn't feel a very different experience to me i'm, I'm actually chilled with it um, because you can still extract what you want and it's just like music teaching is weird anyway because it's a kind of osmosis thing isn't it because you're learning so much from sounds people make people's attitudes how they talk about it it's not necessarily a kind of hard fact thing all the time it's you sort of pick up vibes and mm. sort of viewpoints um so yeah i think that's that's the thing um and certainly going back into one-to-one -one when i'm in a room i think i've got a note to self to keep things a bit more fluent um and uh you know Maybe mixing, I think that's the thing in music uh, teaching, is that about the business of allowing moments uh, where it can flow and then other moments where you actually really demand honing things to an absolute perfection, um, small elements, or can be that particular piece. So that they, there's this combination of people not getting locked into small things and, and then really not being able to deliver you know, with freedom anymore. Um, so you need to do that, but then you also need to hold that performance aspect going as well. Yeah, cool. And um, Laura has another question, but I wasn't sure. Are we doing that one next or was that for later? Why not? So Laura's other yeah. question is about vowel sounds um, in playing. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Now, vowels are huge uh, and wonderful subject. Um, so I'll be as brief as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, we've got you know, a set number of vowels that we can use. Um, so um, I feel that a lot of people just have a default vowel that they're using most of the time. Um, and and I, I think I'm probably the same actually, as in most of the time, but then I'm also very prepared to change vowel sound as and when um, for effect and for coloring. Um, and I think there's a huge amount to be learned from them um, in, di in difference of effect. Um, so having established just the primary, so if I go with an R ah kind of sound, uh, no, let's go for a simple sound, so simple vowels. Ah, ah. And then an R. Ah. You know, of course, there's, you know, it just changes density, it changes um, airflow many things. Um, so that's the first. Then what I would uh, expound is that people then go with varieties of that. So, you know, it depends with your, you know, so it takes, the, for instance, the R sound. So in English, we're going to, we might get an English person saying R <laughs> with a nice posh long R. So R. And then we might get an Irishy kind of Northern Irish thing. Ah. <laughs> which of course got much more bite in it. Oh, you might get an Italian amore. So ah. Um, so there's all different, you know, colorings to, you know, within the same things, depending on how you formulate that particular vowel. Um, and then, you know, it's good to look at all the different kind of subdivisions. So from an O sound, then you can go on to the the O's and the U's and the the U of a long O kind of O, 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 more that sort of thing. And then, of course, you're going towards OW, which is a diphthong, but that kind of R, um, there's many different varieties. And then, you know, with the U's, you've got also the umlauts, so the U, um, and the French pronunciations, and you've got the nasal vowels in French as well. Of, um, which are there's so there's so many to to experiment mm -hmm. with. Um, so it's not just about that, but one I think is to you could almost like make a list, simple vowels, variety of of those simple vowels, like or any kind of other thing you can think of. Diphthongs are really interesting because things like um, so ow, oh, you're you're it's actually two, you know, diphthongs basically two vowels wound up quite close together. Um, so a is actually a and e a um and that should by using diphthongs and experimenting with those you get a lot of experience about flexibility to change vowel um 
because you're actually formulating too very, very quickly. So we're used to doing that in speech all the time. Um, then the next thing I think about is where you're formulating the vowel. So you've got another set of variables from, if, I, if I'm very bad, like the English R I was doing, but say, say it's an eh sound, and we go like eh, eh, right at the back in cavity. Um, then if you formulate more in the center of the mouth, eh, eh, but then if more forwards production would be eh, eh. Um, so it really, you've got a huge range of variety there from, I mean, basically that's three simple placements for every vowel. Um, but then beyond that, actually, you've also got the nasal. You can push it right into the nasal cavity. So, eh, eh, eh. Um, so you've got actually four placements there of every single vowel you can think of. So there's a huge raft of variables there, which are really exciting. Um, then the overriding thing around the whole group that you discover um, is that um, there are places, there are placements of the cavities within the mouth where vowels ring successfully and where vowels do not ring successfully. So it's often a mistake, um, particularly in the UK, I feel, um, because there's a lot of accent on very open, big playing, um, that sometimes with the thing of open, 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 people actually push the cavities beyond where the sound actually rings. And that can give very cavernous kind of production. And vocally, that would be like, naturally, if I just wanted that, Ah, that's that's a natural placement for my cavity inside. But if I'm then actually think, oh, I must be very open, and then I go like, ah, oh. <laughs> that's you know, it's crazy, Sam. Um, and you you lose the ring, you lose the focus, you lose projection, you lose decibel levels, you lose resonance. Um, so it's really quite it can be quite catastrophic. And you can hear that in a flute sound by like something if I just use my normal. But then I take this more very, very open position. And then people say, oh, that's not very focused. And they start using the option in a strange way. And then the support in a strange way to compensate. Because basically the, the, the vowel formation is not correct for ringing. So you need to know from your own voice. I would do a lot of vocalizing going, ah, and then pick up your flute and keep the same placement of that you know is instinctive where you get a good ring from the vowel that you choose. Whether it's eh or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, yep, vowels. Brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have another live question, Michael. We have so many questions today um, from Monique. And she says, hello, I was wondering if you have some tips on how to avoid a sense of imposter syndrome. Oh, can Camilla, can tell me what that is? Oh. Like, <laughs> like I'm not syndrome. qualified to do this. I'm not qualified <laughs> to do this. Uh, yeah, basically. I'm um, sort of feeling anxiety like you don't deserve to be, for instance, in the orchestra or working with that orchestra. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Don't it, know what you're it, doing. It's <laughs> quite hilarious. I talked to so many people who've got, you know, with when they've first been given opportunities or got a job or something, that I'm sure someone's going to tap, tap them on the shoulder and say, oh, totally sorry, we got the wrong person. Or, or, or we, you know, we, we made a mistake, you know. I mean, it's the sort of stuff of dreams, isn't it? Like, um, <laughs> Uh, or nightmares specifically, <laughs> or, or like we're going like, oh, I'm really sorry. Obviously, we made a mistake, you know. <laughs> um, and it, it's um, it's a very interesting one. And I there's a benefit in it, but there's an awful a terrible side to this. And I think, money you would be so surprised, like what percentage of people feel this kind of thing. Um, so you are absolutely in it with the rest of us. Um, and I come. I sometimes come home from work and go like to my wife, you know, I'm a charlatan. I shouldn't be doing this. You know, I don't know. People keep on booking me, but why, why? You know, <laughs> um, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, it, we just all go through it. And and then some other times you're a bit gung home kind of like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you know, um, but we all have those moments where you just think, um, and it all stems really, doesn't it? From the fact that, to be fine at what we do, we need to be immensely self-evaluating. I won't call it self-critical, I'll call it self-evaluating. Um, so we need to develop amazing skills of self-evaluation. And so all the time we're looking, you know, just after that perfect thing. Um, and we need to hand ourselves with that in a sense 
but never to the situation where it starts being detrimental. And that's a difficult game. Um, and of course, like any other game, sometimes, you know, in the tennis match, you, you think, I can't do anything wrong. And other times you go like, what happened to my form? Where is it? I can't get anything, you know. Um, so sometimes we're beleaguered, sometimes we're feeling chipper. So it's just like that that sort of thing. Um, but please, please, please believe it. Believe me, so many of us are in the same. And I think uh, in a way also, isn't it the fact that because we're musicians tend to be on the sensitive spectrum? Mm -hmm. um, necessarily so. And, you know, um, so I think we often feel these kind of things quite readily because we're a bit flaky, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I remember talking um, to some psychiatrist who was also an amateur musician. Uh, he was like a psychiatrist who was affiliated to um, the Royal Society of Musicians. Um, and he said he just loved musicians because he said they're, they're just so artistic. And the, all the things that people say about the artistic sensibility are just so true <laughs> um and he said he's he's kind of like diagnosed so many people as just like having an artistic sensibility uh, <laughs> um and i think it does leave you a bit vulnerable um but it's necessary to what you do and also the self-evaluation critical straight criticism thing is um and it's just a fact of life and so why well, i think you just like go like oh it's that thing but it doesn't do me any use to to think about it um mm -hmm. And it might not stop you feeling it, um, but you just go, oh, there it is again. And just get bored, get bored with it. Just go like, go away, leave me alone. And, you know, um, yeah. And I'm sure you're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, so our next question is, um, do you have any advice for getting onto debt lists or getting first auditions with orchestras? I am someone who's coming to the end of a master's degree at music college and wanting to get a foot in the door. That's from Anonymous. But I feel like this probably applies to many graduates and master's students and things. It's kind of obvious, but not very, in a way, not very helpful thing to say. Um, but my main viewpoint on this is um, the quickest way to get on those extra lists is just through excellence. <laughs> um, so kind of whatever anywhere is on their development, um, there are sort of, there's benchmark levels. Um, and so it's the business of just trying to rise to the top of the pile, as it were, um, and just be so, so intent on pursuing excellence. Um, because if you, you know, as one rises through, you will be heard by people. Um, and it's a bit of a, unfortunately, you know, it's a bit of a pack thing in that the, 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 you know, the, the more successful ones get the opportunities more readily to be heard, and then they get heard, and then they do a good job, and then they get the opportunities. Um, so in the first place, I think it's very much about just being so determined to get to that place where that, if the opportunities present themselves, that you're in that place to seize them. Um, and so a lot of the now it's brilliant because there are so many schemes and training orchestras and stuff like that to be going for. Um, and this is such a good way, such, such a good way um, of getting a foot in the door because you're just heard by the players. Um, but more than that is that, you know, some people, some players I don't know at all. I've never met them, um, but somehow I've heard about them um, because either my students talked about them or, you know, some other, some, have you heard this person there? You know, um, and that's just because, you know, somebody's made somehow a buzz about themselves. Um, and I think it is a bit a combination of, you know, putting yourself out there. So the other thing I'd say is the more gigging you can do just generally of whatever sort. Um, and, you know, sometimes that means, unfortunately, not earning what one should earn some of the time. Um, at the early stage, it's a bit like being an intern or something. Um, but just getting out there and gigging because you never know who you're going to play with and how successful they're going to become. Um, and, you know, if you build good relationships and you've played together successfully, then that can really have payoffs. Um, also recitals and things, because you never know who's going to turn up. Um, there's, there's been some huge surprises along the way. Um, and uh, yeah. And it's so, they so, it's so amazing to just get that first thing on your CV. Um, and, of course, to get in that position, um, 
it's to like just go for everything go for the competitions go for the um and you don't want to do that way too soon but a little too soon is probably not so bad um and um because if a lot of people go like well they're really talented but maybe it's not their moment right now but you still love the name um and applying is good generally because I remember names so that if I see a long, long, long list, even if I don't, you know, it can be, I remember vetting applications for uh, a job where there were way too many than this organization wanted to actually hear. But, you know, and so we just had to have rules about who was given the opportunity and who wasn't. Um, and it was a kind of blanket rule. It wasn't on a case by case. It was like, if this is the case, then we will give them an audition. It was a sort of, at least it was even throughout everybody. Um, and, um, but, but even the people that didn't, I, you know, you've logged the names. So, you know, it, just getting yourself out there one way or another and just be very, very, you know, proactive about trying to kind of make yourself have an awareness, you know, people have an awareness of you out there doing stuff. Um, and then, but overall it's not, you know, the main thing is just keep working 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 for excellence um and then also you've got the option of playing to players and orchestras that kind of stuff um i think you have to be a bit careful with that one um it's, it's a good thing but you need to be pretty upfront i think about your intention um so i think some professionals get a little bit uh, upset if it's just like can i have a lesson and then it turns out that actually what somebody wanted wasn't an audition um so I think being up front, um, Camilla, you said something about that, didn't you? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I was saying to you, a lot of my extra work initially did come from, si kind of developed from side-by-side -side schemes or whatever that I did it while I was studying. But I have um, contacted, I think, one or two players to go and play for them as a sort of audition slash lesson for extras list. And I personally thought it was best to be say that I was would like to be considered for extra work but also that having just graduated I'm more than happy to have feedback because I'm still trying to improve so yes quite both both aspects of it I think that's a mute point that if I feel there's a kind of like you know what I mean I, I think the players shouldn't feel that they're sort of being used um, if it's up front and you say you know I really like the feedback about where I am and what I could improve Mm -hmm. to get to that place yeah yeah i think that yeah. works well so hopefully that's of some mm -hmm. use. yeah um next we have a question that was asked by katie and also by mave and that was how do you keep motivated to practice during this time oh well it's really easy for me because i'm learning the viola <laughs> 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 so I've got my new toy and I'm really, really excited about it. Um, so I'm practicing the viola. <laughs> um, um, and that sounds flippant in a way. Um, also, I play the piano a lot. I love playing the piano because you've got harmony and things. Um, and, but, and also I play Baroque flute as well. So this is so this for me has provided this amazing opportunity because I don't have to get out, deliver so many notes for so many places. Um, it's a huge opportunity to, you know, to have a bit of time out to do some other stuff. Um, but also I have done a lot of online stuff as well, um, playing wise. So I've, I've been, you know, and I've, I've taken it as a chance to, you know, revisit lots of scales. Um, so, but in terms of motivation, that's what I think is, um, I think there's a bit of a dispiriting thing about practice, I think. Um, that I think it becomes like one of those cycles of bad behavior, you know, that you hear people, you know, that they can't quite escape the way they behave. And I think so often we sort of don't practice in a way that excites ourselves, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so there's the thing of just sort of learning, making a few decisions as you go, and you go, yeah, that was much the same like yesterday and the day before and the last ever so many weeks, years, months, whatever. Um, and I don't think we actually spend much time trying to make practice exciting for ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, that's quite a novel idea, isn't it? <laughs> I think. Um, so I, so this is the kind of thing I'm thinking is that now is a huge opportunity because you've got space. Um, so, you know, just 
think outside the box, you know, like, so what I might do is just general kind of weird things. Um, well, not that weird, but go to your music cupboard, just pick out, maybe pick out like, except you might get a whole lot of composers out of the same, but um, maybe randomly, just pick out a whole lot of pieces, see what you've got, and then look to find what a commonality is between those pieces. So even if it's like one long tune, but then you go like, okay, so this is a Baroque long, long tune, and this is a classical one, and this is a romantic one, and this is from a showpiece, uh, this is cheesy, <laughs> um, whatever. Um, and you just, you know, and then you start looking, so these have got a commonality, but how am I going to do that? And then you look at specifically, get another law out, and go like articulation. Hmm. So how's it been used here? And this is 20th century music, and it's got quite a lot of accents. Um, and uh, or might be completely new and have you know some random stuff, um, but then you're looking at you know your Mozart concerto, whatever that you pulled out, or a C.P. Bach concerto, or you know whatever um, Schubert variations or something, and you're just going like, what are the different demands of the articulation in these pieces? Um, you know, and you know you can, and then look at intonation, then look at tune, look at dynamic event. And you go like, what are the parameters, the dynamic parameters in this kind of music? And then how can I use those to reinforce the sense of style? Um, but also the difference, reinforce the difference between different types of material. Uh, I mean, I've just lighted on one thing to think about. Um, but it's, you know, excerpts can be amazing from that point of view as well. It's about they, they're little microcosms of stuff. So rather than going like, it's excerpt time now. Um, you can tell I'm a reluctant practicer. <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that really excites me. Um, and I think we just need to avoid this whole idea that practice is a kind of like, yeah, I've done my this, I've done that, I've done this, you know, and and now that was the same pattern as yesterday and the day before, et cetera, ad infinitum. Um, so draw up plans um, and then have a normal day maybe and then have a random day. Why don't you le learn circular breathing? You know, it's a great chance. <laughs> Throat flutter tonguing. Um, multiphonics, fourth register, you know, like Kobus was saying. Um, yeah, whatever it is. Um, but just try and throw everything up in the air and see what comes down. Uh, and maybe every day think of some random thing to do. Um, but then another thing I was did think of is that I feel that people get very, you know, our reptiles slightly limited, um, but also people get a bit like flute centric in that place. Um, so I think now would be a fantastic place to do a mixture of Spotify and IMS LP. Um, and because you get recommendations as well, or the radio things, you know, and you see what's recommended, what comes your way. Uh, if you put and start putting in searches, what else do you find? And then see what you can find from IMSLP. So something I just thought about was, I don't know how many people, I'm hoping everyone knows this because it's just one of the best pieces of music ever. Ich habe genug by Bach. Um, and so it's, it's one of the cantatas. I don't, I can't remember the number, I'm afraid to say. But for as a, one I can remember is 156, cantata 156, which is the Bach Arioso. It's a lot of cellist player amazing music it was actually originally 156 it's an obit solo um and um then i would just because i'm slp is your oyster so you just go like mm. oof oboe i'm you know um and it's it's absolutely incredible and so you get you'd get such amazing thing from having heard the stuff working out what that's like on the flute and you learn a lot about, a lot about the flute but also you learn a lot about being a musician but also you learn a lot about this music first um, mm -hmm. and just trying to get lots of experiences. What would it be like? I mean, Dennis has done it, but playing Sibelius violin concerto on the flute, <laughs> you know, just random things, you know, and it's all, now we've got these resources with Spotify and um, I miss RP, you know, well, the oyster. So yeah, yeah. Motivation. Um, think out the box, throw it up all in the air, just be random. Um, and, but also be a bit methodical about having lists like, yeah, so I've done a bit of that, and I'm going to do this. Um, and make a wish list, all types of playing, work out what you don't do so well, um, give yourself an up time of something you do do very, very well. Mm -hmm. I think one of the good things in playing is to realize what you do well and what you don't. 
So I know the things that I feel are less in my kind of musical personality, less readily. And I've worked really hard at those aspects. Um, so I know what my innate personality is like. And if I know that I'm not like this, for one thing I'm not good at is flirting. <laughs> I don't I don't like that stuff. It's not me. Um, and um, and so, but musically, I've really learned. <laughs> and you, the thing is, a musician, you have to do everything. Um, so you could also work out what is, like, rhythmic vitality. Is that something you're not quite so good at? Um, you know, the, the amazing full low register, whatever it is. Um, is to you know sort of work out the things that because uh, yeah it's very very important actually because often we're applauded for the things we do well and we go like oh I must do that but actually you should almost look at the mirror thing they say they like that so what are they leaving out <laughs> <laughs> anyway I hope that helps yeah oh um, yes we were going to talk about those other motivation things oh uh, yeah so, do you want to mention those oh well um, I there... did a bit of research well. Um, many of you might have already seen on Facebook, there are a couple of groups that have popped up um, since, I think since quarantine, basically, of one called Etude of the Week and the other one called Orchestral Excerpts of the Week for Flute. And both of these are flute groups where every week um, the group host or whatever, I don't know what they're called, um, chooses an, an excerpt or a, a study. And then flute players from all around the world record, learn and record these studies and by the end of the week, post them on this page. Um, and lots of people can give encouragement and feedback and things. And um, I personally haven't done it. Um, I might do it at some point, I'm not sure. But um, it's it kind of gives a, a set thing that, that everyone has to learn this study this week. And it gives a deadline, I guess. Um, and it also gives a community where you're not just doing it on your own for your own sake, you're doing it to be heard by someone. So maybe it's a little bit more pressure or just a bit more motivation to have a recording by the end of the yeah. week. It makes an event of it as well, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's yeah. something to gear towards. It's lovely having deadlines as a musician. We're used to yeah. working that way. Yeah. 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 And I've just noticed the time and I'm on page four of my eight pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no ways I'm going to get to the end. Um, uh, so I think that means we're going to have to have another one in a bit. <laughs> um, so probably in about 10 days, something like that. So we'll, we'll put out the next date. Yeah. We'll yeah. work out when. And thank you very much, Camilla, and to everyone for all their questions and stuff. Yes, so. thank you. And thank you, Michael. And also, once we've done another Q&A, do keep an eye out for this online masterclass that we're hoping to set up in the next few weeks or so. And we'll um, actually, just out of interest, if anyone's, you know, anyone could say they would like to do that, it would be yeah. useful to know, you know, what sort of uptake we might get. Mm. Um, it would be useful to be able to, for planning to know you know how many people would be interested in doing that definitely yeah comment yeah. on the video to say if you'd be interested in playing or watching or um just so that we know that there'll definitely be people that want to be involved <laughs> fantastic thank you michael pleasure bye everyone thank you everyone for the questions Have See a good you time. Soon. bye bye